Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Very good to have you all here. Let me start by introducing myself. I'm Ina La Petra from Insight International and also board director at UCOMS. And I'd like to convey my thanks to our colleagues from SPOT who have uh, shared with us their music. I give the floor to them for a brief hello. So, hello? Oh, hi. 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 Um, well, we're all here from Spot. We're an art studio in Alkmaar for uh, young adults with mental health problems, or if it's if you don't feel nice in life, you can always come here. We love to make art. We uh, make poetry, music, theater, uh, all kinds of art things. And um, we were actually a little nervous to make a video for you guys because we always uh, look at the process. We always invite everybody to do something you've never done before. So have you never written pro poetry? Okay, you're gonna write poetry. Have you never played this instrument? Go and play this instrument. So you just looked at a video of people performing that have never performed before. The text is written by somebody that never wrote text before. Uh, there are instruments being played that they've never played before. So it's we just wanted to say that what you really looked at is us having fun. And uh, yeah, we really love, yeah, having fun. And that's what the song's about, that life should be a playground. Thank you very much, everyone. And it sounded great, particularly now that I know that it is the first time you've been playing and writing. Very impressive. Thank you. Let me um, continue our introduction by giving the floor to Ross, uh, Callum Ross, who is a peer expert and partner at uh, Happy to S Collective in the UK. Ross, I give you the floor. Thanks so much. It's annoying. I have two first names, so it's really difficult to know which one is which. Um, yeah, so I'm Callum. I'm, uh, um, I've am i been invited today because I'm a peer support leader. I have a lived experience of mental health and service use. Um, and uh, I've been a director of a large mental health service in Canada. And I've helped build lots of strategies for mental health organizations. And I'm Canadian and I'm Scottish, and I facilitate the International Peer Leadership Network, which is a space for peer leaders, people with lived experience, who want to push things, change things, and be a bit different, uh, can come together and build a bit of collective power. And originally, years and years and years ago, I, I trained as a person-centered therapist. And I told you all of those things because I believe the and is really important, and I believe the and part is the next stage in lived experience leadership. And it was so great to listen to Spot because it's saying I might have lived experience and I'm an artist and I'm a musician and I do all of these things. The future I believe can no longer be tokenized through our lived experience. We're smart, we're capable, we're accomplished as people with lived experience, as peer supporters. Um, and I think what makes us different is people who talk so openly about our lived experience is I contribute. I may be all of those things that I said and, but I'm always contributing first and foremost with my lived experience of my mental health. Uh, and I'm bringing that to uh, the conversations and the work that I perform every day. And that's really difficult. Uh, and that's what I work on. And that's what I enjoy. I've made a choice to do the peer support work, to do the lived experience leadership. Um, most importantly as well is uh, I uh, represent a community and I get power from that community of lived experience. I am connected to lived experience folks from across the world, locally here where I live in the UK, uh, and I get my health from that community, I feel like, more than anything else. Uh, and I'm also held to account by that community too, um, and that's really important to me from lived experience uh, perspective. And so how does all of what I've just told you kind of link to what's happening today? Well, when I started working in and around the mental health world, I was quite young, actually. It was 2003. I uh, was a little bit thinner and definitely a little bit younger. I volunteered with a small organization called Kids Help Phone. And even at that time, I felt uh, I felt really, really uh, strongly about lived experience and peer support. And I've always believed that those two things, peer support especially, is the vessel, is a really great vessel for us to transform the mental health system, improve it, change it into a way that really meets our community's needs. 
And it wasn't until later into my career that I learned about the concept of recovery, which we'll be covering as well tonight. And uh, I really got excited the first time I heard about recovery because it seemed to me to be permission to break the limits of the traditional mental health system and to be able to see people who used it as not kind of, as long as you're stable, that's okay, that's enough. Um, um, it allowed people to have dignity of risk and it's a model that matched my own belief really, really strongly. Um, and I suppose finally it put responsibility on me now as a system actor, as someone who delivers mental health services or is a big part of that, to change the system a bit. Um, not just for the people in that system receiving the services, they weren't the ones that always had to change. It was the system itself who had to be better at delivering. Um, so I'm so excited to hear uh, first from WHO and, and their Neto European initiative where they're going to be talking about transforming the attitudes of mental health, accelerating this change process so that it's universal. And I see lived experience and peer support central to that. Uh, that is really, really important to me. And I suppose the other thing I'm really excited for is the panel about recovery across Europe. As an anglophobe, we uh, anglophobe. As an anglophone, uh, we have a bit of a bad habit of looking to the other side of the planet uh, before we actually just look across the channel to Europe um, for inspiration when it comes to what recovery can actually do in lots of different settings and lots of different places. And um, and I think the other piece that um, I really want to challenge is that often I think living in Northwest Europe, we might be a little bit superior sometimes, and we believe that other people can learn from us rather than learning uh, kind of from all across Europe. And I think that's what I'm really excited about is to personally challenge myself. And I'm so happy that I'm gonna be learning from leaders in Europe, from the East, from the West, from the South, from the North. I think we've covered that. But I think that's probably enough for me and enough about my story. I will kind of connect at the end of this evening with some reflections, but back, back over to you, I will. Thank you very much, uh, Callum. Very good to hear from you. And it is our tradition at UCOMS to always start with um, an introduction from somebody with a lived experience, and it is very important to us to always continue to engage. Um, I would like to um, give the floor to um, my dear, very old colleague and collaborator, uh, Dr. Lydia Nazeri, who is the um, regional advisor from the WHO Regional Office Mental Health Program. And I'd like to say that um, she has kindly agreed to share with us her um, the program that WHO has today on the Mental Health Flagship Initiative. And also, I hope that you will contribute to the panel discussion. And as Callum mentioned, we are going to focus on how we can support recovery looking from the perspective of the local and national ecosystems. Maybe I give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, dear Yonela. Thank you, dear Callum and uh, colleagues. I'm I'm very humbled to be invited here today, and uh, and also very um, um, uh, privileged, I should say, to be uh, together with colleagues that are from all over the world. Basically, I'm I'm so moved to see all the the the, the introductions in the chat. People are coming all the way from Toronto to 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 Turkey. So. Uh, thank you so very much for inviting me to this um, exciting uh, evening today. Um, and also, uh, Ionela, we are old date friends and colleagues. Um, uh, <laughs> but like Callum said, I have also uh, been working with WHO for more than uh, 20 years and um, in various uh, settings, both service development, um, uh, uh, mental health advocacy, uh, policy development, and uh, in, in various contexts. And that brings me to uh, the pre my presentation today, which is actually introducing to you how uh, what is WHO doing in terms of mental health, how it has prioritized uh, uh, mental health as a flagship priority, and then uh, how this um, is is being operationalized. I don't know if you, okay, is, is my screen okay? This is in presentation mode, you see, okay. So what I'm going to talk is a few words about what is WHO and how does it work? I don't take it for granted that people know how WHO functions and works. I'll try to make a couple of reflections on diversity, 
then um, um, introduce what is the scope of the mental health flagship program and the importance of cross learning as indeed the key to the evening today on uh, how can we collaborate with UCOMS and, uh, and, and in between various uh, mental health initiatives and experiences. Um, so WHO was established on the 7th of April, 1948. We are already 75 years old. Uh, if you, for those of you who may remember, 7th of April is the World Health Day. So every every year, WHO establishes a particular topic, and it is celebrated always on the day WHO was founded. It is composed of uh, 194 member states. We are a member states organization, which means that we are governed by the World Health Assembly that gathers annually in May every year. So the World Health Assembly is composed of ministers of health of all the WHO member states. And the, um, the meeting that, uh, that uh, comes together in May, every May, it is indeed a very important event for WHO because this is where the discussion of the WHO guidelines, the discussion of WHO budget, the directions, the strategic directions of WHO are discussed. WHO functions through seven major offices. One is our headquarters in Geneva. This is where the, WH, the, the World Health Assembly comes together. And we have six regions, starting from uh, uh, Eastern Mediterranean, uh, Europe, Southeast Asia, Pan American uh, region, and the Western, uh, uh, the Western Pacific, of course, the African region as well. Uh, our region, the WHO European region, is the largest of the WHO regions. It is composed of 53 member states, and as you see from the, its composure, it, 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 it inherits the legacy of a different geopolitical constellation in Europe, because as you see, we have all the European Union countries, but we also have new, uh, new independent states that, that came from the break of the former Soviet Union. We have Caucasus with Georgia, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Armenia. We have Central Asia with five uh, republics, independent republics in Central Asia and the Western Balkans. The, it is governed, we are governed in WHO European region by our regional committee that gathers annually each September and by the standing uh, committee for the regional committee in the interim. I have always also put the, the acronyms. We are infamous actually about the use of acronyms. So if you happen to bump into those acronyms, at least some of you may remember that WHA means uh, the World Health Assembly. Um, we have a, a public health mandate. We are among the other UN agencies, such as UNICEF, UNDP, um, UNEP, the uh, UNESCO, etc. We are a specialized UN agency that have a public health has a public health mandate, and then we lead the global efforts to expand universal health coverage. WHO directs and coordinates the world's response to health emergencies, and then works to promote healthier lives from pregnancy care through old age. And we, when I say we, the WHO staff, it's actually the secretariat, acts as the staff of WHO acts as secretariat to the member states, because as I said, we are a member states organization and we are governed by the elected governments of our member states. Now, when it comes to Europe, we are uh, led by what we call the European program of work that calls for united action for better mental health in Europe. And the Mental Health Coalition is one of the four flagship initiatives of this EPW. The, the, our program of work is called EPW, and it expires at the end of 2025. Uh, the, and for those of you who are curious, what are the other flagship uh, initiatives? The other flagship initiative is immunization. Not surprisingly, of course, uh, as the, this uh, uh, step, uh, went all through COVID, so it was very, very timely that immunization was already identified as a flagship priority. Uh, the other is digital health. Of course, with all the technological advances, we cannot ignore the potential, the opportunities that digital uh, technologies bring into expanding healthcare, but also the duty to care for uh, safety, safe uh, use of digital technologies. And the other, it's quite innovative. The other. Uh, flagship. It's quite innovative because it talks about behavioral insights, behavioral culture uh, and, and cultural insights. And it is, um, uh, an, in a way, an innovative approach to look into how people behave vis-a-vis -vis their health care, the health, the, vis -vis their health, the health of their loved ones, and how this impacts uh, health-seeking behavior and also health outcomes. 
Now, uh, we uh, in in WHO Europe, our um, uh, current operational framework is the Framework for Action on Mental Health 2021-2025. It was endorsed by our regional committee, by our ministers of health in September 2021. And you see that all the three uh, major strategic directions of WHO, have, of, uh, of the global WHO, have been uh, kind of translated into our European context through uh, mental health service transformation. And here we talk about self-care and management, mental health in community and general health care settings and long-term care and support. And not only, huh? I have only uh, highlighted here the ones that are more prominent, but there is more there. Um, when it comes to protecting people better against health emergencies, we talk here about integrating mental health into this very difficult acronym, EPRR, that is actually Emergency Preparedness, Response and Recovery. Uh, this is this is especially important now in the WHO European region because we have suddenly become this region with multiple emergencies. We had um, never, um, since the World War II, we had never had in our region that many emergencies that go from man-made disasters like uh, conflicts uh, between uh, the, the war in Ukraine, of course, notably, but we also had an escalation between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and we are also having a crisis uh, in, in, in between Israel and, uh, and the occupied territory of Palestine. We also had an earthquake in Turkey, a massive earthquake in Turkey that uh, warranted a lot of uh, mental health and psychosocial support to the affected populations and not only. And when it comes to the third uh, priority, it's about mental health uh, promotion over the life course. So we talk about children, adolescents and young people. We talk about mental health of older adults. We talk about suicide prevention. We talk about mental health in the workplace. And in a minute, I'll come to uh, tell more about how we are trying to operationalize that. Then um, I have been invited also to talk a bit about the the. Uh, the Pan-European Mental Health Coalition that was launched as a high-level event on the 30th of September 2021. For those of you who uh, know about Belgium, you would know that the lady in orange there is the Queen Queen Matilda of uh, of Belgium. She is there because she is champion of mental health at the UN. When when we have the UN General Assembly, Queen Matilda is there to talk. She is a former uh, mental health professional. She is a trained psychologist, so it's very much at her heart. And this is our regional director, Dr. Hans Kluge, who made mental health a priority in the WHO European region. So we had the launch, this very high level launch in uh, um, a bit more than two and a half years ago. Um, and we call it a pan-European because we want to make sure that it's for all those, all the 53 member states of the WHO European region. No, so it's not only the European Union, not only the Western Balkans, but it's across all the 53 member states. Now, this is an implementation mechanism. Now, why, why we needed a, a, a European mental health coalition? Um, we, we have made a reflection in, in WHO Europe about the fact that um, WHO published its very first uh, World Mental Health Report more than 20 years ago. It was in, 20, in, in 2001 when the world saw the first World Mental Health Report that, uh, that was very aptly named uh, um, Stop Exclusion, Dare to Care. And if you compared the the what um, uh, how much um, ahead the world has gone in since since that time, it's not much. And even even in the WHO European region, that is a bit better resourced than other regions in the world, we still have a huge disparities not only in between our member states but also within the member states within a, within a country. You have those disparities where you have better access to care, for instance, in the capital cities, and then uh, in the remote areas you have nearly no uh, access to mental health care. And therefore, we need to think differently about mental health. So it's not only about knowing what to do, but it's also knowing about how, uh, uh, knowing about how to do it. And also analyzing a bit why haven't we been able to move ahead so much in the last 20 years when solutions were already proposed 20 years ago. So why those solutions haven't been uh, uh, embraced and haven't been endorsed to the extent that we would have wanted at the time the World Mental Health Report was published more than 20 years ago. Ago. 
So the Pan-European Mental Health Coalition is an effort to create um, a, a kind of a critical mass of uh, stakeholders, of partners that share the vision, that share a voice, that share an interest, that share expertise, that share experience, that share resources to contribute for making mental health a priority, not only in their own countries, not only in their own context, but also across those countries, across the whole European region. So uh, it we we have envisaged the Pan-European Mental Health Coalition as a support mechanism for the implementation of our framework for action on mental health. It is a structure for exchange between diverse members with shared interest in driving change. And when we talk about diverse members, it's not only about members that come from very diverse uh, countries. As I mentioned, we have still in our uh, region countries that invest uh, almost 98% of their mental health budgets go to asylums. So there is a huge diversity if we then remember that there are other countries that uh, invest massively on community-based mental health care. So there is a diversity in the area of investments, for instance, and, and the budget allocations, but there is also diversity in between what the members do represent. So we have mental health professionals there, we have policymakers, we have persons with lived experience, we have, um, uh, and, and by persons with lived experience, we also consider those who have been involved with the lived experience as family members, as friends, as carers, and so on, mental health advocates, and so on. It serves as a platform for peer learning and networking. It allows coordination of advocacy efforts amongst coalition members. So, for instance, we're very happy to see when members uh, of the coalition reach out to each other saying, oh, I heard in that meeting about this practice. Uh, can I know more about that? Um, and I talked about the need for diversity of uh, the stakeholders, and you see here uh, who are the members and supporters of this coalition. Um, and then uh, how did we envisage the, the work? So how do we prioritize? We had this exercise on the middle of February 2022, when we had um, about 150 people from all over Europe that gathered online. It was still uh, the, at the time of uh, exclusively online meetings. And uh, we discussed about how to prioritize the aspects of the European Framework for Action on Mental Health. And this is where we came. We came to discuss about those working packages that you see here that have a number. The first working package is mental health leadership and anti-stigma. The second is mental health and well-being of children, adolescents and youth. Then we talk about mental health and well-being of older adults. Both those groups, children, adolescents and youth and older adults were very clearly affected. Um, their mental health and well-being was affected during COVID. So we learned the lesson and we tried to prioritize um, uh, action on that. Then, of course, we cannot afford not to take action on mental health and well-being at workplaces, recognizing the fact that workplaces are increasingly um, important into uh, the, 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 uh, the social tissue of a society, the social fabric of a society, and can play a very important role into uh, preventing risk factors and uh, responding to, to needs, to mental health needs. The fifth working package is mental health and um, and psychosocial support in emergencies, and that was uh, this this prioritization was made. You see the date, and some of you will recognize that this prioritization was made only a few days before the invasion of Ukraine, and that means that. Um, uh, we were able to then mobilize a large network of experts from not only from all over Europe, but also from the world to, to be deployed to, um, to, so to, to not only inside Ukraine, but also in the refugee receiving countries, neighboring Ukraine, to support the authorities, to support refugees, to support the host population with various um, uh, interventions and tools. And um, so this is how we have been able to, to, to work in this um, um, working package. And uh, the sixth and the largest working package where UCOMS is certainly very much, I think, interested and invested is mental health service transformation. And this is the largest because here we not only talk about how to 
transform services from, for instance, institutions to community-based, but also how do we talk, how do we maintain uh, uh, competencies and capacities of staff? So what happens with mental health professionals? What happens with uh, uh, financing? What happens with digital tools, et cetera, et cetera? So all those are various dimensions of this uh, large package that is the mental health service transformation. Now, um, we uh, have um, embarked upon a collaborative agreement with the European uh, Union, with the European Commission, DG Sante, in supporting member states, the EU member states and Norway and Iceland into addressing mental health um, um, challenges. And uh, the first activity that we did last year in frame of this collaborative agreement with the Commission is to conduct a survey on mental health systems systems capacities with those countries. It was 29 countries. And so it's 27 EU members and then Iceland and Norway. So you will be interested to see that the most frequently cited priority area, and I think you will be happy to see that, that priority area number one is diversification of mental health care offer. So even though we are talking about the countries that are members of the European Union, presumably the countries that are the best resourced and the most advanced in terms of having designed appropriate mental health policies and services, still diversification of mental health care is seen as priority number one. And you will see then uh, the, the, how, how the prioritization goes. So uh, the mental health promotion is, um, is the second and capacity improvement so it's no, no surprise why those three are, are the most prioritized areas. Again, in the same uh, survey, we uh, tried to capture what are the enablers to policy or program implementation. So um, the member states identify the need for having mechanisms in place as enablers. So when you have mechanisms in place that are uh, like good governance, good coordination, this is an, a good enabler. A high level of community cooperation and interaction a strong buy-in of mental health sector stakeholders. And then uh, you see um, uh, uh, also that uh, the, the, when, it, when it comes to uh, strong buy-in, I'd like to draw your attention <clears throat> on the buy-in of people with lived experience, uh, families and carers. And you see here that um, this as an enabler is not very high up in, the, in, in, this, in this chart. And this will come as, um, as no surprise then when we go to the next slide that talks about barriers. And you see here the limited buy-in of people with lived experience, families, carers is identified as a barrier. So while we have in the enablers, this is not seen as a particular enabler, this is seen as a barrier uh, in, in this slide here. So there is something about the buy-in of people with lived experience, families and carers that needs certainly to be addressed into how policies and programs are designed, implemented and evaluated and, and, and measured. Now, um, for those of you who would be interested to know more about uh, what the collaboration with the, the European Commission consists between WHO and, and, and European Commission exists, is uh, that we have those pillars that uh, you see as, uh, as outcomes in different colors. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to, to, to focus on all those. But I would like to focus on the on the light blue outcome two that is tailored capacity building, because this is where I hope we can find common scope with UCOMS, uh, because we talk here about um, uh, quality rights toolkit training, which is in a way a WHO signature tool for advancing the institutionalization, securing. Uh, making sure that rights of persons with mental health conditions treated in mental health care uh, facilities are, are, are maintained. We talk about delivery of community mental health guidance. And for those of you who are aware, it is, it's a guidance, so it's a toolkit. It's a set of documents that talk about how to develop community mental health care in various settings. 
we talk about um, a training in professionalization of lift experience. And I want to call uh, to recall here what Callum uh, introduced at the beginning. He introduced himself as, um, uh, as, as how he has departed from his personal lift experience into becoming a very strong um, uh, design, uh, um, designer and shaper of mental health policies and and services in his context and what and and you Callum, you mentioned also that the uh, the tokenistic approach to lift experience should end and actually the the 2.4 um, output here that talks about training in professionalization of lift experience aim exactly as this thing so that lift experience peer supporters are not only uh, uh, having a chance to have a harmonized uh, capacity uh, building but are also recognized as a, as a, as one of the mental health professions that needs to be compensated and remunerated appropriately and duly as everybody else that is a mental health service um, delivery professional. Then we uh, we focus on uh, training in mental health leadership. I'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, training of the WHO Mental Health Gap Toolkit that some of you may be aware, some of you aren't. And for those of you who aren't, is a WHO signature toolkit that aims at expanding capacities for um, uh, delivering a, a, a level of mental health care in non-specialized settings, primarily in primary health care, but not only. So, um, and, and we are discussing now uh, with every member state, um, we have talked with some of them, we are uh, talking with some uh, with, with the others about what among those tools they would like to take in uh, for further capacity building, for further development from WHO in frame of this project. And again, for the sake of time, I'm not going in detail through these outcomes, but I'll be happy to respond to any question if this comes uh, in, um, by the participants. And last but not least, I'd like to also inform you that um, in order to discuss about uh, the most pressing topics, we are organizing a hybrid workshop on leadership, anti-stigma and service transformation in mental health in Brussels 22 and 23 May uh, 2024. So it's in, in two months from now. Some of you that are around, uh, that are attending this, uh, this meeting have already received uh, the invitation from WHO between yesterday and today. And uh, you may wish to remember that we are convening only those mental health coalition members that have signed up for working packages one, that is focused on leadership and anti-stigma, and working package six that focus on mental health service transformation. This is because those not not because the other areas are not important, but because we are working in the other areas separately, and those two are are now, now is the time to uh, present, introduce, and share uh, off with the members what is going on. The meeting will go through introducing the anti-stigma draft toolkit that we are working together with King's College London. Uh, Professor Graham Thornycroft and his team and our team in WHO Europe are working to develop this uh, toolkit um, in, follow in response to one of the recommendations of the Lancet Commission on Ending Stigma and Discrimination that was published in October 2022. So we aim at launching this toolkit on the 10th of October this year on the World Mental Health Day. It will be the meeting in Brussels will be a chance to present the draft toolkit and to con to obtain um, feedback from the participants. Uh, similarly, together with the Global Leadership Exchange, and I saw um, um, Sean is uh, is I, I think Sean Sean Russell from uh, Global Leadership Exchange is. Uh, or Steve, probably Steve Appleton, is uh, in um, in the meeting. We, together with the Global Leadership Exchange, we are working towards developing a, a training synopsis for mental health leadership um, capacity building um, a, a stream, and we are going to introduce it there. And similarly to the Anti-Stigma Toolkit, we will uh, ask for feedback from the participants. We are focusing on mental health investment and financial protection. There is not, there is very limited um, mental health financial protection um, um, uh, consideration possible because there is still very little data about how to uh, collect uh, evidence about mental health financial protection. We want to focus on mental health in primary health care. 
because with uh, dropping numbers of specialized mental health professionals in all our countries, we need to strengthen primary health care capacities in delivering a, a, a some level of mental health care. And we are focusing on continuity of care. This includes, of course, the institutionalization, community care, transition from um, adolescence to adulthood and from adulthood to older age. So transitions in a, in, in a, in a very wide uh, sense of the word. And of course, uh, Yonela uh, had the, uh, the nice idea to use this, uh, the WHO World uh, Mental Health Report diagram that you see here on the, the right side of this uh, slide as a template for this meeting. And uh, I'm very happy to say that our meeting in Brussels is, is indeed very much looking into how can mental health services fit or, or how can, can this diagram help mental health services to collectively come together for better access, better quality, better outcomes for mental health of the populations. And with this, I'm stopping uh, my sharing and uh, I'm, I'm thanking you very much for uh, inviting me and for your attention. Thank you, Yonela, back to you. Thank you very much, Nadia. It's really impressive to hear about the inspiring work the WHO is doing, the broad scope, but also the complexity and the relevance to our network. We are very happy to have you here tonight. Thank you for taking the time. And I will move quite quickly, looking at the time, directly into the panel discussion. And what we want to focus on uh, tonight is how we can leverage the, mental, the local mental health ecosystem for transformation that engages everyone, 360 engagement towards a sustainable recovery centered um, service transformation. And I will start directly by giving, uh, I asked all the panelists to present briefly their local ecosystem, and I give directly the floor to Tor Helge, and then we'll have the uh, joint discussion. Tor Helge, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ayonela. Uh, my name is Tor Helge Tjelta. I'm from the city of Oslo. Uh, I'm a chair of a Norwegian Association for Mental Health and Addiction Care, and also the board director of UCOMS. I try to use the diagram, and uh, here is my perspective of the mental health ecosystem in Norway. And um, I will focus uh, mainly on the community mental health services. And uh, we have three levels. Um, and the first level is run by the municipalities. We have 357 municipalities in Norway. And the second and the third level is uh, run by the state, the government through the hospitals. And uh, we have a really strong primary mental health and addiction services in the municipalities. And we have uh, started with community mental health services and centers in the 80s. And they are called district psychiatric centers in the hospitals. They're also private providers, also in cooperation with municipalities and the state. And also the inpatient treatment in the hospitals, the third level. The pros and cons in this ecosystem. We have a universal health coverage, and uh, as I said, a really strong primary mental health and addiction services. Uh, every 357 uh, municipalities have to have a mandatory psychologist and uh, their treatment in the municipalities. Also, we have... Um, uh, peer support is growing both in the operational and the strategic level and we are started a new 10-year escalation plan on mental health last year. In the community mental health services we have a, a large focus on a flexible act and now also on fact youth. There are about 100 teams in Norway now. Constant is uh, still divided, addiction and mental health, both in the first, second and third level. There are, uh, as I said, <laughs> in Lille in 2018, the, the, um, there are still discrimination, stigma, human rights and coercion. We can be, do better on that. There are no communication digitally between the different electronic patient journals. And we have lack of good data. So uh, I hope uh, uh, WHO can help us with that. Next slide, please. So Helge, you have to wrap it up. Yeah, briefly, 
Here is the organization from the Norwegian Health System, the municipalities, primary care, and the state run the regional health trust for them, hospital trust and hospitals. And uh, public health is in the counties. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Helge. I really appreciate also keeping the time. And it is my pleasure now to give the floor to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Matthias Albers from uh, the city of Cologne. Matthias, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jonella. Um, yes, I'm from Cologne in Germany, and I will uh, try to uh, tell you briefly about this extremely complex system uh, of uh, healthcare in Germany. Um, uh, the, the most important thing is uh, that actually there's not these two tires of primary and specialist uh, care in Germany. Many if, if people think Germans are a little bit strange, and uh, they definitely are. The GPs in Germany are uh, uh, special specialists for general medicine, but not uh, general medicine. Uh, so it's it's all one uh, level, and everybody is free to access uh, whoever uh, he likes. Uh, but uh, a lot of the uh, uh, tasks uh, that uh, in this original version of this diagram uh, are related to the primary uh, uh, care uh, level actually are performed in Germany by a very special organization type. This is what you see in green at the top, uh, the municipal health authorities who are all these uh, things about STD, tuberculosis, uh, homeless people, and uh, other groups with different difficult access to the uh, uh, standard system. And we, what we have in Germany is a very uh, isolated hospital systems. They are no longer state hospitals, uh, but they are a world of their own. They have only very limited access to outpatient uh, treatment. They only can uh, treat uh, 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 a number of uh, SMI people, uh, but uh, uh, else uh, that's something that's uh, done exclusively by the specialist uh, psychiatrist care uh, for outpatients, uh, but not actually on the primary uh, care level. Uh, community mental health uh, services uh, are uh, uh, important, of course, but uh, they are uh, relatively poorly funded because most of the money goes into the hospitals. Then there's a lot of money that goes to the uh, uh, doctors and psychotherapists and uh, uh, their offices and uh, the actual uh, community mental health services are uh, mainly uh, funded uh, by municipalities uh, uh, or uh, at least at a uh, sub-state level. Um, and, uh, but, um, uh, uh, what I want to stress is uh, that outreach uh, work is something that's uh, nearly exclusively done by the municipal uh, mental health uh, uh, teams and uh, uh, hospital uh, uh, in the hospitals is just presently starting that uh, they really can do home treatment but there's uh, uh, not a, uh, at 10% uh, implementation most of the hospitals still uh, although it's been possible for three more than three years, uh, there's hardly any implementation going on. Um, I think that's the most important points. Thank you very much, Matthias. We appreciate it. And I give the floor to our next uh, panelist, uh, Alexander, Dr. Alexander Tomchuk from Montenegro. Alexander. Good evening. And thank you for inviting me for this panel. 
uh, as you see, comparing to these uh, two previous ecosystems, our system in Montenegro is pretty much uh, simplified. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, the, the part uh, regarding community mental health services is uh, completely empty. Uh, in, in in a short, uh, I, I can say that we are really a small country with only 600,000 uh, citizens with a good distribution of health services, and it should be advantage for us to organize uh, mental health services on the proper way. Uh, the first reform uh, uh, in this direction started on the beginning of the 20th centuries by establishing a mental health centers, which belongs to the primary health care. And uh, unfortunately, uh, after it, uh, they didn't do too much. Uh, uh, thanks to some EU projects, uh, uh, we, 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 uh, we were uh, informed uh, and uh, staff was educated how to, to make uh, a community mental health uh, teams and uh, how to organize the psychiatric ser services uh, into community. But due to political cha changes recently in the last three years, I, I can say that we even moved uh, backward uh, because the stakeholders they didn't follow the uh, strategy what what was uh, expired last year and uh, they are uh, continuously uh, do uh, <laughs> uh, wrong things uh, by by increasing the number of staff in uh, a huge hospital uh, and uh, uh, in in institutions and they don't pay too much uh, attention uh, uh, in community mental health uh, care. So I'm afraid that uh, I don't bring the uh, good news from Montenegro at, at the moment. Thank you so much, um, Alexander. It's very interesting to hear about the developments in the country. And I will move on with our next presenter, uh, Mr. Tiberio Rotaru from uh, Siret Hospital in Romania. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to speak in this uh, very interesting webinar. Unfortunately, there is not a lot to say about the things going on in Romania and about the ecosystem and mental health in Romania. Uh, as I like to say, we are uh, in a country that uh, the reform in mental health, it's never ending, but it's never starting. So talking about community mental health, we really don't have a real community mental health. Our mental health system is based mostly on the hospitals. Uh, and on the outpatient care and on the on private practices. So what we are working on right now and what I would like to stress is that we are working on a, a paradigm shift in order to respect the UN convention, in order to develop new community mental health services that are made uh, suitable for the for the uh, users uh, that's not easy for example we only have in the whole Romania only two mobile teams community mobile teams both of them are working totally voluntary there is not a legal system in order to provide income for the people working in the community mental um, health uh, teams also we don't have a system for using peer workers in our community mental health um, uh, teams so uh, it's easy to complain a lot about these things but i think it's all it all has to do with individual pioneers in, in order to change things and to learn from one one from another. Uh, that's why I think WHO and UCOMS, they can be very helpful in order to push things towards community mental health uh, services. Thank you very much, um, Tiberiu. And I would like to give the floor to our um, last panelist, uh, Professor Manuel Franco Martin from Spain. Thank you. Thank you very much for counting on me for this meeting. I come from Zamora and Valladolid. I'm going to, to explain about the, our system. We are in the in the core of Castilla Leon, is a region of Spain, and we applied a, a system called reticular model is uh, addressed to to join or to establish a network of mental health without splitting in between the hospital care um, and community care. 
we can see in the slide that the, the arrow is the service in the hospital and the department is not working just in the hospital, works in the community and psychiatrists, psycholo clinical psychologists and mental health nurses move to the primary care centers to work with the uh, GPs for attending uh, close to the patients in the community, in the rural areas, for working with the all uh, primary social service. It means that we have not a specific no, uh, mental health center, and even all the community, the rehabilitation is made in the community. We don't work in a hospital for rehabilitation. All the beds are used for acute and the average of stasis around uh, six to 12 days and all work with the day hospital with the uh, moving to the houses of the patients and the, the rehabilitation is provided from high support in the first step in the uh, uh, training for autonomy and supporting housing is a uh, high support and uh, we work with the patient for in uh, grow the autonomy of them and in this way we reduce the support next slide please after applying this model in these two areas, Valladolid and Zamora, the, you can see how the stays in the hospital drop down in both places in different times. We apply the system first in Zamora and we can see in the uh, left slide um, later in the, just before the, the, the COVID outbreak in Valladolid and the results were the, the same. Well, the main points of the of the reticular model is all psychiatrists, psychologists and nurses provide all uh, mental health um, activities or service is one department uh, covering all the area. And uh, we were in the primary care, cent care centers we moved to the social setting as in homes, institution for mental handicaps, or non stay resident for severe mental health patients, working all the activity of mental health is provided by the regional health system. And for us, for the department, we go move to the own, the own houses of the patients, supporting house and a psychosocial rehabilitation unit. So the social network was integrated with the mental health network we share decision, we share the decision with the social network, and is, uh, we split just the functional structural service are split, it, but uh, the fact is that we, we can work together in the different settings. It means that the mental health care is provided by mental health network functionally, no matter where in the social settings too. The social support is provided by social network, even in functional, even in the hospital. If we have to provide social support, the, the social workers no, uh, and all the workers of the social network uh, goes to the hospital. It means too that the mental health setting are addressed specifically for remission and rehabilitation of patients and social setting are addressed for recovery with the support of the mental health network from health. And weekly, we have uh, weekly meetings involving all the, uh, both networks in order to provide an integrated care for a uh, severe mental health patient. Thank you, Thank you very, very much for your attention. And thank you very much, Emmanuel, and thank you very much to all the panelists for the brief introduction of their services. And I'm aware it's a very, very brief one because there's a lot to say about each of your local ecosystem. Um, I'd like in the last uh, five minutes we have from this uh, panel discussion session to have a bit of discussion and hopefully continue the discussion during the Q&A session later on. Um, to ask you, what do you find are the biggest challenges in engaging with uh, particularly the other sectors? And I'm talking here not only about the traditional ones like social care, but also the police. And, and if you find the engagement from the ecosystem perspective, if that works, as in treating them with um, the same 
level of respect and understanding their perspective, not always expecting our perspective to be understood. So if any of you can start reflecting on, on this. Maybe, yeah, maybe I direct. Yes, please. please. So uh, coming from a uh, coming from a very small community, it's very easy to build an ecosystem, uh, as I call it you before, uh, to build networking in order to help our users to get integrated into the into community. Because what I strongly believe is that it doesn't matter how beautiful and how strong you build an institution if you don't break the walls of the institution in order for the users to get into community and to get to get integrated into community, then the institution is not working because the institution is not for itself; it's for the users. So we can work together with all the other uh, stakeholders within community in order to help our users to find their place into community. But the problem that we have for the moment is that it's only locally, but we are not supported from administrative national level or from the legislation level and also from the national insurance house too. So it is a difference between the local ecosystem and the general national ecosystem too. Thank you, TB. Anybody else? I, yes, my yes. I think that the the main problem for for that in terms of ecosystem is when we are in the boundaries, when we change from a, a network to another network, is what is represented in the template provided. I think that the point is that provides a continuity care from the hospital to the community care without any gap, because uh, I think that the the we have to keep the mind of community care from the hospital. It's not uh, we cannot change the strategy from hospital to community care, and it's necessary to change the mind in many cases of the uh, mental health workers working in the hospital, and from the beginning started to think in recovery. In that way, uh, and with the continuity of care, working with the same professional, the same department from the beginning to the end, no matter where the patient is. It's, the, it's because sometimes we split the patient in, in the different needs and we have to, to, to see the patient like a whole. This is just one, it's not, uh, we have to, to put the patient in the center and the different providers to see what we can do in an integrated care. I think that the, the, in Spain, mainly, the main challenge is to work together in the different levels of care. I th that's why I think that we have to, to um, uh, avoid these boundaries, these uh, borders in, be in between the different levels of care. That's my okay. opinion. Thank you, Manuel. Anybody else would like to reflect? Um, well, I think there's a, a big problem in uh, the different mindsets. Uh, I think the people, many people working in the hospital, they think a hospital is where people get well and a community is where they get ill. Uh, when we're working in the community, of course, we think community is where people are living and uh, where uh, everything that concerns them should happen. Uh, but if we uh, talk to uh, uh, some kinds of stakeholders in the community, uh, they think uh, that everybody who doesn't fit in uh, should uh, be uh, got away with and uh, put to some place where he, he or she can not disturb everything and uh, so especially uh, with the police. Uh, there's there's a strong, uh, but also many uh, people in the community have a strong wish that there should be nothing annoying around and that everything that might annoy uh, has no place in the community. So there are, I think, it's, uh, at least three different mindsets uh, around. And if we would uh, look closer, there might be even more uh, that are not really uh, compatible. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, if there are no other immediate points to make on this, um, anybody else? Maybe, I don't know. Okay, I'm looking at the panel. I don't see any hands raised. Then I would like to propose that we take a little break, a musical break, um, and continue the discussion with, and we still have uh, sufficient time to have a more, uh, more discussion among the panelists and together with the audience. Uh, and I would invite everyone to put their questions in the Q&A. So please uh, share with them, share with us your uh, thoughts and your questions in the Q&A and we'll come back to it after the brief uh, musical break. Thank you. The fog takes over, the eyes turn gray. There's a wall between me and reality, keeping us separate. I can see through the eyes of someone else Through that window I can see myself standing there It makes me kind of scared Turn gray, there's a wall between me and reality, keeping us separate. This body isn't mine, I feel disconnected from space and time. It makes me wanna cry, salty tears down my face, yet I don't feel a thing. Thank you very much, Spot again. Really good to have you with us. Yes, Lisa, you want to say something? No, okay. Thank you very much. I would like then to move to the next session of our program, and that's a Q&A session. And I see a number of comments and questions in our, um, in our chat and in our Q&A session. One uh, question was, um, one comment was from Stuart Campbell. Um, crisis and community care both have a role to play uh, for the, the different levels of, of care, and that's clearly the case. And we have a very specific question, which I understand was also asked in, in Cologne. And I hope that maybe, Lady, I ask you to answer that question because um, I have an idea about what WHO view is on it, but I think it's best that you answer to that. Uh, the question is what is the ratio, that what is the ideal ratio? 
um, in an ideal mental health system between the experts um, uh, by profession and experts by opinion? Is it one to 10 or 10 to one? So that if you could answer that question, maybe if I may address it to you. The microphone. Yeah. Yes. No, thank you. Thank you, Andre, for the question. I don't think we we do have a an ideal ratio, and uh, I'm not aware that there exists an ideal ratio. But I cannot agree more with you, Andre, than uh, on on the po on the point that uh, uh, persons with lived experience should be the backbone of the of the service delivery. Unfortunately, there is a long way to go through to go through to to that ideal, because um, we need to we need different culture for the services. One thing that I was thinking, Yonela, when uh, when you um, just before the break, when you asked about the enablers uh, for ecosystems, and I would I was thinking about one barrier for ecosystems that is stigma, <clears throat> very active stigma, and then in many cases stigma and discrimination. So um, attitudes and the uh, service culture and very active uh, stigmatizing belief and discrimination practices do not allow uh, the, uh, the inclusion of persons with lived experience as peers to mental health teams. And so far, there has been a lot of success into having peers organized into organizations that are somehow um, a, a parallel to mental health services, to the public mental health services. And then even in the most advanced situations, the leap need to have to happen where services run by users are becoming, uh, have to become an, an integral part of the system. So unfortunately, I do not have an answer about the ratio. And then you makes, uh, uh, Andre makes a question of one to 10 or 10 to one. But certainly um, something has to change for uh, mental health teams to become uh, inclusive of lived experience, not only as part of the of the package that is offered, but lived experience as part of a respected and compensated and remunerated uh, mental health um, workforce. Thank you very much, Lydia. Really important point on the involvement and peer uh, service users and peer workers, and we are always very keen on that. And I see another question from uh, Romania um, on the integration. What is uh, on the services that are really available at primary care level? Maybe can I address this question to you? I don't know if you've seen the question. I can read it to you. I'm interested if the speaker uh, outside Romania can detail a little bit more about mental health in primary care general practitioners in Romania that just refer patients to psychiatrists. If you can answer to that, TV. Me? Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, do, um, should I answer to that? Because it's easy for yes. me to answer. Okay, sorry, I, I, I'm not uh, hearing very well. So uh, the, the problem in Romania is that though we had a couple of European projects in order to train GPs for uh, uh, providing mental health services, their input on that is kind of limited because outside of a, a general and uh, very primary screening of people with mental health, they show to their offices or when they do the uh, home visit, and they can see some uh, some problems regarding mental health. Their input is very limited, so they can only refer people to uh, psychiatrists or to <laughs> mental health services. The other problem is that even um, a user go goes comes out from the hospital and it's in need of other services outside the hospital. These services really don't um, don't exist uh, financed by the state in order to uh, have access to uh, psychotherapy, for example, or to group therapy or to support groups, then the, uh, they mostly are based on um, private uh, private practice. So unfortunately, though a lot of our GPs are trained in order to get more than screening on, on mental health, the <laughs> legislation is still very, still very limited on their, uh, on their practice, on their uh, concrete practice. Thank you very much, Tibi, and I'm afraid I misunderstood the question. Uh, thank you for the um, person who asked the question for uh, Radhika for, for clarifying. I think the question was addressed to the others. How does that work in your other settings? If anybody can comment on that. Um, yes, well, Matthew. Yeah. 
Okay. Just... In in our case, uh, the care if or the the um, uh, the primary care the, the GPs the well, the work of GPs is mainly to identify the problems of. <clears throat> But uh, the care is provided by us in the primary care center. So uh, we we detect with the or we work with the GPs in order to establish what is the first treatment that is necessary to apply. If the psychologist psychological treatment, in that case, the psychologist move to the primary care centers and works with the GP providing the treatment in the primary care center mainly is very important in rural areas that the accessibility of the patient to the hospital is more difficult. And in case of this necessary, the, the intervention of psychiatrists or for pharmacology or for uh, establish a better diagnosis or even for applied psychotherapy, the psychiatrist is working in the primary care center too. In between, the mental health nurses uh, visit uh, all the houses of severe mental health patients in that uh, small area working uh, uh, for this uh, primary care center. So, the the burden of the mental health care is on the network of mental health and the main activity of the gps is to to detect and just very mild mild problems because i think that the the the, the training of gp and time of the gp is not uh, the best and for from for, for us is very important, mainly in the first stage of most of the mental health problem, even for the risk of suicide, to apply uh, psychotherapy treatments. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Manuel. And I think Matthias, you wanted to answer as well. Yes, and uh, in Germany, it's, uh, it's not so uh, beautiful because uh, if uh, you discharge from hospital. You uh, since some years, you really may get a prescription for the medication uh, from your GP. Uh, but uh, for everything else, you would have to be referred either to a psychiatrist or uh, you uh, might uh, go uh, to the community mental health center where there's. Uh, uh, no possibility for prescription, but you can uh, get counseling and get uh, support with housing, with, uh, with your work issues and everything else. Uh, but as I said, this uh, it's not a real primary care uh, level. Uh, so uh, there's uh, also no uh, uh, mental health uh, orientation uh, with the GPs uh, actually. Thank you very much, Matthias. And Lydia, there are a number of questions addressed to you. You probably saw them. Would you like to take them? Or select some of them? The yes, you... yes, thank you. Um, I'm starting from what appears last in my, um, in, in at least that it's addressed to me. Um, from Marie, um, it says, Lydia, you said that peer workers should be the backbone of the organization. How will you make this happen? And will the WHO work to get better salaries or even get peer workers paid for the job that they are doing? Um, I think the work we are doing is based on the on the uh, recognition that nothing uh, about us without us. This is the the, the mantra of any um, work that includes uh, persons with lived experience or any 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 work that includes end users, like whatever is. If you have a disability, but if you are a beneficiary of something, you need to be involved into the planning, design, and implementation of of that thing. And then um, what we're doing because because you are very, uh, very concrete, Marie, in your uh, in your question, is um, we are also recognizing that if we um, 
uh, advocate for uh, peer workers to be respected and considered as mental health professionals. They, like other mental health professionals, need to be um, enrolled in a kind of a certified um, uh, training, certifiable capacity building training that gives them um, a, a, a capacity and competence to do what they need to do. Uh, we are working with Mental Health Europe, that is the largest uh, umbrella organization of um, um, advocacy NGOs in Europe. We are working with them and especially with uh, colleagues from Ireland to, uh, to, to develop what we call a curriculum for uh, 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 training peer workers that can be accredited by various uh, institutions. If that curriculum will end up being a diploma, a certificate, a master's program, we'll have to see along the way because it will be a process of consultation with our members of the with the coalition members, and then we'll have to see uh, where where does it where does this bring us. I think this is the first uh, step of making the uh, peer workers a recognizable profession and then uh, the rest should um, should should um, uh, stem from there so we are in 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 baby steps but we are getting uh, uh there hopefully um can i go ahead uh yes, please go ahead again. yeah Maybe okay because there are questions. yeah yes. there are a few more questions that are at least um we're very excited to be here so clearly also <laughs> to yeah, uh, Colleen, um, thanks for sharing. Although we all belong to the European section of WHO, uh, we are there are sus substantial differences between our welfare systems. In all countries, mental health problems are attended with a significant risk of social exclusion. People without a postal address might simply disappear from health surveys. Even in high income countries such as the Netherlands, they become invisible. How does WHO manage re this risk of underrepresentation? Um, if I can very humbly say that um, we do not have a mandate to manage that risk of underrepresentation because that is uh, on the member state level. However, what we try to do to 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 say is to advocate for um, uh, um, preventing exclusion through involving all those that can reach out to people who are at risk for inclusion. And, and um, Yonela, you asked the question before this break, you asked the question about how to create ecosystems. And I think the need for ecosystems is precisely, this is the most important um, um, uh, uh, reason why we need to have ecosystems so that there are people who do not fall into the cracks of the systems just because healthcare or mental health cannot talk to other aspects of uh, healthcare uh, uh, system and then health doesn't talk to social and social doesn't talk to education and education doesn't talk to employment and employment doesn't talk to um, law enforcement. So in, in a way, the, uh, the creation of ecosystems, what we talk about in WHO, um, um, all uh, whole of society and whole of government approach should um, make sure that people uh, that risk of ex exclusion is present is is prevented. Mm -hmm. And and of course, then there are also interventions about people that have fallen out of, of the system, such as assertive outreach, so community care. There are a lot of evidence-based interventions that can that can uh, reach out, that can assertively look for people who are at risk for getting excluded. So uh, uh, in between creating ecosystems and using the necessary interventions and proven evidence-based tools for uh, uh, for addressing risk of exclusion, uh, that should um, should kind of be a good combination. Thank you, Nadia. Maybe um, I address a question to um, to to Helga from Norway, but there is at least one more. The last question I see and is definitely just to you, and maybe there's one more as well. But to Helga, there's a, a question addressed to Norway. What's the problem when uh, money or housing social welfare isn't a problem? <laughs> Interesting question. <laughs> a good question. Uh, I think to ha we have to have um, uh, a stronger leadership, both on the operational and go uh, and uh, strategic level, and uh, better in incentives, uh, stronger incentives for cooperation, cooperation, 
Uh, and um, we are just starting with uh, uh, peer support. Uh, IMROC in the UK had a goal once uh, 50% of the workforce <laughs> with lived experience. Um, and uh, if you, uh, during a lifetime, 50% uh, of us are going to have a mental health problem disorder, so <laughs> we can recruit them. And um, so I think we have to use better uh, the lived experience knowledge and uh, transform the services. And uh, I try to use the ecosystem uh, as a paradigm. Also, we try struggling a bit with the recovery. So we have to a new way of uh, leading this. And also I think we have to have a more strong uh, primary health care and also our friends in European Forum for Primary Care also eager for the, for this stronger primary care and stronger primary mental health care to, to switch this. Also we have um, uh, we, the government have done stop the reduction of uh, psychiatric uh, beds in Norway so we have the money but how to do it yeah that's a good question and now we have to the ten year new ten year escalation plan. And the last one also on quantity. Now we have to look at quality. So we have to have much more better data with the help with WHO, I hope. Mm -hmm. And also uh, eager the the global leadership that change and mental health metrics, how to use this, how to better target evidence-based mental health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Helge. And indeed, that's uh, the question, the big how. How can we make it work? And because it's not a given. And one of the points we've uh, heard a lot in the last period from other uh, collaborators is that what is very difficult is to make sure that while mental health is central and mental health services and professionals are central, they're not taking charge, that we can genuinely engage on a collaborative basis with all our partners across the board and make them um, party to, uh, to to the uh, challenge that we face, because none of us can do it alone, and we certainly cannot uh, succeed with just our mental health services. I'm seeing uh, quite a few questions and comments in the chat. Thank you very much for that. I um, would like to ask Lede if you would like to answer the question that I still see addressed to you on the framework. And the recently yes. published framework, yes. Yes, very happy to. And thank, thank you very much for that question, actually. And uh, in addition to the document that you referred to, Godfrey, there is also um, another framework that is youth engaged for mental health that is, is uh, developed by WHO Europe. It was developed really as a co-creation with, um, with young persons with lived experience from uh, that are members of our mental health coalition. So it was truly made by, uh, uh, by and for uh, young people with uh, lived experience. Now, um, it is easier said than done, uh, the, the question. So what, what is WHO doing is uh, two ways. One is two, two levels. One is that um, the development of what I mentioned at the beginning, the, the toolkit for uh, anti-stigma, for addressing stigma and discrimination, because in WHO, we believe that stigma is still uh, the major barrier for, um, for uh, uh, policies translated into for first of all designing the right policies uh, then uh, translating those policies into practice so stigma is in a way at the root at, at a great to, to a great extent is at the root of uh, uh, of um, of a number of things including the lack of of uh, lived experience representation so we uh, use we will use the, the this toolkit that will be launched very soon as one way of um, of, um, of address this problem. The other way is that in all our meetings, in all our events, in all our capacity building activities, uh, persons with lived experience occupy a very great deal of space into uh, being there, being present, because as the, the, as the Lancet Commission on, on Ending Stigma and Discrimination found, the social contact is the best answer to address stigma and to, to improve the attitudes around persons with lived experience. Experience. And therefore, by having uh, more and more pe persons with lived experience 
uh, um, uh, being uh, addressing uh, uh, forums with policymakers such as ministers, etc., is the best way of how to bring the lived experience closer to where policies are cooked, are designed, are planned, are implemented. Thank you very much, Lydia. And I'd like to acknowledge a couple of comments that we have. We had a comment from somebody from Ethiopia on the, the mental health system and the um, uh, situation there. Thank you very much for that. And also, I think there's a comment or a question on stigma, which I believe, Lydia, can be combined with the current question. I think you answered already the interventions that it was a question about what interventions are available. And it sounds like the participant is coming from uh, an African perspective and was asking about European ones. And I think that uh, perhaps the, uh, they can find some answers in the framework that will be uh, WHO framework, the new WHO framework. And um, a last question that maybe uh, we take one minute to ask the panelists. There was a question on the integration of uh, mental health into mainstream services, partly answered with regards to primary care, but maybe if there are any other reflections from the panel uh, group on this, not just primary care, but also in the mainstream um, health services. Are there any comments on that? And otherwise, I think we will need to stop with the questions and answers for the session soon. Um, <clears throat> well, I think it's, uh, of course, it's an important question to uh, ask, how are these uh, services funded when uh, uh, when it's uh, fee for service, uh, then the integration into uh, a fee for service system would not be uh, very uh, positive for the outcome if uh, the mental health system is not uh, fee for service. Uh, funded, but uh, can uh, uh, give uh, 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 more uh, 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 has, uh, uh, solutions that are not uh, have to be ticked off uh, point by point, and uh, only, can only be done if the special intervention is refundable. On the other hand, if uh, there's uh, solid uh, funding. Uh, then, of course, it's uh, better to have uh, services that, that are more integrated and uh, uh, less uh, specialized, because always uh, being a specialist service means you are uh, not uh, competent for a lot of other things and have to refer people to other places. And, of course, a special system for mental health, in a way, isn't... Uh, really compatible with the uh, idea of inclusion. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, but on the way to that, it uh, uh, may well be that for some time, uh, specialist uh, services uh, that uh, really can cater to the needs of people are more adequate than a completely uh, mainstream service uh, that's uh, uh, not able to uh, do individualized care. Thank you very much, Matthias, uh, for that. And thank you all of you for the contribution and also the questions that are, we will um, answer the questions after the seminar. We'll try to do that in writing. We'll take note of them. Then I will have to stop with the question and answer session. And I would like to give, uh, so we are in, ahead of uh, ending the seminar. I'd like to give the floor maybe to each of the panelists to just say uh, their goodbyes and to also ask Renee when uh, Kate, who is the chair of the um, UCOPS network, to uh, share with us the information about the upcoming meetings. Very briefly, if anybody wants to say anything in the um, last word uh, of the panelists before we end this session. Um, Okay, I don't see anybody doing that. Then, Rene, please. Okay, go on. yes, go on with the slide, Rene. Yeah, okay, then, yeah, because it's also, in fact, it's already half past. So I hope people can stay yes. for some minutes more because we still have the final words of uh, Callum uh, to come. And, uh, but thank you for being there. We had 19 countries, if I counted well, today from three different continents this evening. A great performance of Spot, and uh, so thank you really, Spot, 
team for for your for the wonderful videos i hope we can uh, ask you again because this is really high quality and we also spread on our social media um if you allow us uh, to do so because it was really a professional sort of video we we loved it and also <laughs> your screen looks the best of all screens so that's uh, <laughs> very colorful thank you for that you want to say something Lisa? Yes, we wanted to say thank you. And we made all this artwork and you saw it in the videos. Yeah. And um, we just wanted to say goodbye and thank you. And Micah wrote something in the chat. She okay. wrote um, the Instagram of our band. Yeah. And they created a band called Funky Punky. So you can follow <laughs> them on Instagram. And it means a lot if you like our the videos with the heart. And you yes. can also look uh, at uh, Spot Alkmaar. If you want to see what we're doing and we always really appreciate it if you uh send us a message or give us a heart if we make something nice okay you well so you, you 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 deserve it so we make sure that you have hearts from different parts of the world and uh, yes. thank you, thank you so hearts. very much thank <laughs> yes. you everybody and you're doing yes and we and we love you and i will come back to spot uh, soon again to uh, yes, to play you better we're going to play the game again <laughs> okay okay uh, they're very good at games so, <laughs> so okay, thank you bye, for bye. that bye. bye and this is so but this for the people please stay a little bit longer these are the saved dates for of of the yukov's events uh, we will have another seminar in lisbon in november 21st 22nd november on sustainability of care <laughs> We have a seminar next year, March, in Greece, in Alexandropoli, uh, of the Society of Social Psychiatry. We have a webinar coming on September 18 on LHBTQ uh, with speakers from different countries on the, the, the how that relates to mental health. Very important topic. And uh, then November 27 on peer support in prisons among refugees contribution from Norway. So there's a lot of interesting things to do, always with a lived experience part in it and always with some live music in it so talking about lived experience i give the final word to callum ross thanks so much uh, i will try my best to be brief but there was far too much good stuff um i think this is a note i want to make um having been around in the world of peer support and lived experience in close to 20 ish years now uh, it is so I, i'm like we always say in peer support it's about what's strong not what's wrong and what is strong today is that everyone talked about lived experience and that did not happen even, geez, even five years ago. Yeah. And there we have a room of, sorry, a room of clinicians who all talked about how important lived experience is. You're all weird. And this is a brilliant time to be alive, I think, and an exciting time in mental health. Um, challenging barriers as well as um, from a lived experience perspective, I think is a virtuous cycle. The more we do it, the more things are going to change, the more stigma is going to change. And so here, here's the very beginning. And I just love that quote of like the institution um, has to be for the users, not for itself. Let's go break the walls. Uh, what a great quote to get us kind of moving and changing. I think I can give one caution because I can't help it. I want to be balanced. Is that if we think that lived experience is going to be the thing that disrupts our system, that means it has to challenge power and we have to be very careful. I think lots of us in this room are power holders. And that means that there's a real risk that lived experience, peer support will be systematized rather than changing the system. And we're very good at systematizing things. Look at the profession of social work, look at the profession of occupational therapy. Both of those roles, I think, originally wanted to be system disruptors and they've been very well systematized. And I think when we think about training, training is easy and I support good training for great peer supporters, but let's not allow that to be the only action. That's why I talk so much about peer leadership. Um, um, you can look to the US, the US has training for almost every single peer supporter and peer support, I would argue, has not changed the mental health system very much in the US. You can look to England, who's hired 5,000 peer support workers into their health system and it's been a bit rocky. There's some really great things, but let's learn, especially if you don't have peer support already in your system, there's a, uh, there's a huge advantage in being second and, and, and about asking the right people the right questions. You don't know what you don't know. Uh, and I suppose my last piece is, is your, you know, when you describe, Lydia, the emergencies that are happening across Europe at the moment, in Armenia, Azerbaijan, the earthquake, um, the wars in Ukraine, in Palestine, these 
things will not necessarily just be solved with clinician support. They're going to need lived experience. That's the solution. And I think one of the only proven solutions to anti-stigma is, is lived experience and lived experience voices as clinicians aren't very good at reducing stigma. Um, and so that's the things that I get really hopeful about is I absolutely a place for us as people with lived experience. Apologies for taking too much, but you were all far, far too interesting. And I just would love to be a part of it going forwards. Thank you very much, Callum. And uh, thank you very much to the entire panel. Uh, really a pleasure to have you all with us tonight. And thank you for the participants who hang with us uh, until this late hour in the evening. We very much look forward to seeing you at future events. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye.